No big fancy open tonight, just right to me, but I think we should keep the music playing for a little bit. I know you guys like it so much, let's just listen. Yeah, crank it, crank it. Do people still like that music? I mean, do people still hate that music? <laughs> people don't like that music, but I still love it. I, I, I listen to it when I run. I'm Dan Haggerty, hi. Thanks for being with us. It's Friday, as you can tell, we got some Friday vibes going on right now. Um, all the ways to communicate with us at the bottom of the screen. Use that hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. Email us at the story at KGW.com. I want to hear what you have to say about tonight's stories. Let's get started with the first one, shall we? So the big story tonight. The city of Portland is facing a lot of challenges. You know that. We talk about it all the time. We see it every day. One of the most visible ones, though, might be the cars and the trucks and the RVs that are parked on city streets. I mean, often lined up one after the next after the next, right next to parks, in front of businesses, sometimes right outside of people's homes. As investigative reporter Kyla Boshi found out, the problem is not going away. In fact, it's likely to increase as evictions and foreclosures rise. But there may be a solution just down the road. Broken down cars and RVs line the street next to Nick Johnston's home in Southeast Portland. I would say that it definitely takes a toll on us because we don't know who's going to be outside of our house. I mean, He's like, compassionate, yes. Yeah, definitely. But after months of headaches, including trash, drugs, and all kinds of late night chaos, Nick says he and others have had enough. I know that our neighbors feel the same way that we do. Um, you know, we got to understand people's situations, but there's also a point where it's like, okay, our safety is at risk here. Yeah. In the first seven months of this year, Portland residents filed more than 3,800 complaints with the city about abandoned vehicles, illegally parked cars, and debris in the roadway. That's a 107% increase from the same period last year. I don't see it getting any better. Neighbor Jerry LaDuke, who's lived in the Lentz neighborhood for 40 years, argues this growing problem on our streets can't be swept away. Really, it's, it's just like the tide's coming in and the tide's going back out. When you see the garbage that's picked up, you know, dropped off, picked up, cars, trucks, you name it. And then it never seems to totally end. There is an alternative. Several cities, including Vancouver, have created safe parking spaces so people living in their cars or RVs have a safe and legal place to stay. It's a lot safer than being out on the street, so at least for me anyways. Michael Helms still has chalk marks in the tires of his RV after ringing up hundreds of dollars in parking tickets and being forced to move from one spot to the next. It's hard to try to transition from trying to find a job and then just leaving your stuff out there because Potentially, it's either going to get towed or it's going to get ripped off or it's going to get broken into. Vancouver's safe parking zone, set up at an old C-Tran bus transit center, holds about 50 cars, RVs and trailers. There are portable toilets, hand washing stations and garbage cleanup. We want to keep it clean and keep it nice and everybody be happy about it, you know. Residents must follow strict rules like no drugs or alcohol. The goal is to provide stability. So people like Dale Moon can eventually find permanent housing. Well, last past year I've been going up from uh, sleeping in a pickup in the cab to a camper and then to a camper to a motorhome. In the short term, this safe parking area gives people a secure place to store their stuff. Yeah, mine's, mine's the one with the pumpkin, of course. <laughs> Instead of spending right all day looking for a place to park, they can focus on finding work or the support they need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It also helps alleviate some of the stress between neighbors and strangers parked on their street. You uh, can't sleep very well because uh, you never know when at any time someone can knock on your door and say, hey, you can't be here. you got to leave right now. Similar programs have also been set up in Eugene and Beaverton. What is it that makes this location desirable for you folks? Well, it's, it's quiet, uh, it's sort of private, especially where our, our parking program is. Dr. Vernon Baker, director of Just Compassion East Washington County, says there's a healthy waiting list for the 15 safe parking spots scattered across five locations in Beaverton. We're seeing more and more people who are, who are gainfully employed, uh, but they just don't have enough to move into a house or to an apartment, so therefore they're living in their vehicles. Baker fears and the end of Oregon's uh, eviction moratorium will force more people out of their homes and onto the street. I think we're gonna see a whole lot more people living in their vehicles. Portland City Commissioner Dan Ryan had proposed using the vast Portland Expo Center parking lot 
as a safe parking space for cars and RVs. But Metro, which owns the lot, said no. Instead, the regional government offered use of a grassy ditch area that would take $1.5 million to redevelop. Talks are still underway. It gets out of hand. For neighbors like Nick Johnston, this problem yeah, can't be ignored. The mess outside his home needs to be cleaned up, and people living in their cars and RVs need a better spot to park. I think that the residential areas are, need to be kept safe, and they need to be kept uh, up to a certain level of um, cleanliness. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's talk to Kyla Boshi about this for just a moment and talk about demand. How many parking spots would it actually take? We don't really know. It's difficult to count because people are moving around so much in their cars and RVs. We do know vehicle residency, as it's called, is one of the fastest forms of homelessness in the country. There clearly is demand, though. Vancouver is looking to expand a second site. There's so much demand. Also, Tigard is looking at developing a program just like this. A lot of people, a lot of communities want to help out with this. They want this to move along a little faster. Is there anything that a private citizen or maybe a church or something could do in the meantime? Yeah, in the city of Portland, churches can develop these safe parking spaces. There are some restrictions, and they've tried, although there has been some backlash, some controversy, which is the challenge here. Oftentimes, neighbors say, yes, we want to help, but when it comes to their own backyard, ah, they're yeah. not so quick to step up. All right, Kyle, thank you. Now, let's take a second and circle back to what Kyle was saying about the Expo Center. There's a ton of space there. You can see more than 50 acres of it, lots of parking lot from this aerial footage. Portland City Commissioner Dan Ryan told us that he's been in talks with Metro since February of this year to use that as a parking area for homeless people living in their RVs or in their cars. But Metro wouldn't let them use any of the already paved areas, only the grassy ditch area. And as you heard from Kyle, that's going to take about $1.5 million to redevelop. Now, earlier today, we reached out to Metro for their take, and they told us, quote, if Commissioner Ryan's office is interested in pursuing this option, more due diligence is needed to determine the real cost to convert the gravel lot into a safe, viable option. We encourage others to consider what they might be able to offer as well. Now, Metro also to told us that they've got to think about the contracts that they already have for the people who want to use the Expo Center for business needs because it brings in millions of dollars into the city. Now we get emails almost every night from people living all over the city. People telling us the problems that they're dealing with, things with crime or mental health concerns in their neighborhoods. It's a message, it's the same message that we hear over and over and over from people, that these are serious problems and that people aren't safe and that it's only getting worse. Let's zero in now on just one area, far out in Northeast Portland, near the airport. Now keep in mind, if you're visiting if you're visiting our city, this might be one of the first things that you see. The trash piled up, people living in tents and broken down RVs. If you stay in a, in an, a hotel near the airport, you might have to deal with some of the things that guests at the Best Western on Airport Way have seen. Uh, we had one in particular guy that would constantly come in and he was convinced that we were holding somebody hostage, his girlfriend. Um, so he constantly was trying to break into a room, a particular room, get into the building. Uh, we get hostile with the staff or a guest um, to the point where we ended up with an assault. And this is a mental health case. Who did you call? We called 911 multiple times. Um, every time he came onto the property, the more and more hostile he got, we just kept calling 911. Now, business owners in that area say that's really only the start, kind of a drop in the bucket type of story. They've had to deal with theft and vandalism. Their employees have been harassed and assaulted. They don't feel safe when they are at work or they're trying to get to work. They've been talking with some, we've been talking with some of these business owners for years now. I mean, this isn't exactly a brand new problem that's emerged, but they have said that the problem is getting noticeably worse. And these problems are costing them a lot of money to try and manage on their own. When we call police, the response is that their hands are tied and that they really can't do anything to help the situation. So as a perfect example, for me, we installed um, a $10,000 camera system. And no matter what we gather with people trespassing or um, stealing from our property, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing that the police are able to do. The Park Rose Business Association tells us in just the last year, owners have spent at least $300,000, 300K dealing with this problem security updates that they've had to do, paying customers sometimes for damages, or just general cleanup. The business owners that we talked to all agreed that the police aren't helping them. And then, you know, when we do call, I don't ask an officer to come see us anymore because they don't have time. When I call the non-emergency line because one of our cars got stolen, I was on hold for four hours. 
So there's just, it doesn't seem like we're getting anything for the taxes that we're paying and it doesn't feel like they're listening to anyone other than one type of individual, which are the protesters, the rioters, and feeling compassionate for the homeless. Where's the compassion for the owners of the businesses and the neighbors? There is none. They say they recognize that this is not the only neighborhood dealing with these types of issues and problems, and that is actually, they say, their biggest point. No, I never imagined that we would be in this position still after this long um, and seeing that it's actually growing compared to when we first initially spoke, um, that we were trying to put a dent in hopefully bringing awareness to the situation, but it's, it's growing and now it's affecting business more in a time where we're struggling to survive already, um, given the pandemic, and then having these issues on top of it's making it even worse. Now, speaking of the pandemic, why don't we talk about COVID vaccines for just a minute? We are, of course, just 10 days away from the mandatory vaccine deadline for state employees on October 18th. And this includes thousands of people, healthcare workers and teachers and Oregon State Troopers. According to the Oregonian, at least eight lawsuits have been filed in connection with this deadline, including one by a group of state troopers asking the governor to temporarily halt the mandate. Well, a judge yesterday ruled that the governor acted within her right to create the mandate and that they threw it out, adding this. The police power of the state includes the authority to enact public health laws that may have the effect of curtailing individual rights. This isn't the first loss for state employees hoping to fight these vaccine mandates. Earlier this week, the Oregon Court of Appeals said that a group of health care workers, para paramedics and firefighters hoping to fight the mandate have, quote, little to no likelihood of success with this case moving forward. That doesn't sound good for them. And hey, as of October 18th, as that mandate approaches, we're going to keep an eye on these issues, the staffing changes that might become issues across the state. As usual, if you have any questions, if you have a story you think we should pursue regarding that, please let us know. Email us at the story at KGW.com. Now we got this question from Joanne. She said, hey, Dan, I read about a 37 year old woman who died of COVID-19 VITT. Just to put it in perspective, I wonder how many young women have died of the disease instead of the vaccine. So Joanne is talking about 37 year old Jessica Berg Wilson. She lived in Seattle, but she grew up here in the Portland area, went to Oregon State. Last month, she died of VITT, according to her obituary. VITT is an extremely rare blood clotting disorder that has been linked to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. You may remember the FDA and the CDC, they actually paused using the J&J &J vaccine a little earlier this year for that exact reason. But they resumed it after only 11 days because researchers studied it closely and decided that the benefits of the vaccine far outweigh the risks, even when they can be that extreme. So that brings us back to Joanne's question, because as of today, 708,784 people have died from COVID-19 in the U.S. since the start of this pandemic. 7,972 of those people were in Washington and 3,959 of them died here in Oregon. As for deaths linked to the J&J &J vaccine, Jessica Wilson was the first in Washington and the fourth person to die from the complications in the country. 15 million doses of J&J &J of that vaccine have been administered nationwide. And again, four people have died. The CDC says that they see about seven cases of VITT, the blood clotting disorder, for every one million women who get the shot and that it prevents nearly 300 hospitalizations for every one million women. Now we realize that that doesn't make it any easier for the family and the friends of the person who died. Jessica Wilson leaves behind two little girls. And according to her obituary, she didn't want to get the vaccine. That she only got it so she could continue to be the room mom at her girl's school. But we wanted to put this into perspective for you. Officials in Washington released a statement about her death saying, quote, as with many medications, the risk of serious adverse events is small, but not zero. It is vital for people to have this information in order to make their own informed decision. Why don't we count our own vaccines right now? Just take a look at who's got them here in the state. As of this afternoon, more than 2.8 million Oregonians. There we go. How's that? Have gotten at least uh, one dose of a vaccine. 
uh, a lot have gotten a second dose as well, but we are at 67.1% of the state's population in Oregon with at least one shot. In Washington, more than 5.1 million people have gotten at least their first dose, which works out to be 67.9% of the state's population. So some big news this week for Oregon's death penalty. That could mean nobody is currently on death row. But Oregon has had a moratorium on executions for like 10 years now. So we're gonna go into the KGW vault for a look at the day that decision was announced. It's time for this state to consider a different approach. I refuse to be part of a compromised and inequitable system any longer. We're gonna look at the case that led up to that decision and what kind of reaction it got when the story continues. Hey, welcome back. Were the commercials good? I like them too. Um, thanks for being with us. Thanks for all the questions and comments that you sent in to us. I'm still reading through of them. I'll try to address a few at the end of the show, depending on how much time we have. But let me know. Email us at the story at kgw.com or use the hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. Also, don't forget about this. This is one of my favorite things we talk about every night. It's our Hey Help campaign. And this week, we are asking you to please consider donating to Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women USA. They are an organization based in Oregon that works to find indigenous women. Your donations help them to do the work that they do, spread the word about missing Native women, and they pay for the basic supplies and needs of their families who lose a loved one. If you want to help them out, just open up the camera on your phone, point at that QR code we have on your screen right now. It'll take you to a link where you can donate or go to kgw.com slash heyhelp. This is a micro donation drive. Feel free to give any amount of money that you can muster, no matter how small. Now tonight, we're still waiting to see what kind of implications we see of an Oregon Supreme Court ruling that will have on inmates who are sitting on death row right now. See, right now there are 23 people on death row in Oregon, but they all had their crimes recently reclassified under a law that passed two years ago. And now none of them are convicted of aggravated murder. And that's the crime that you need to be convicted of now to receive the death penalty in this state. So yesterday, the Oregon Supreme Court, they vacated the sentence for one of those inmates, this man, David Bartol. They ruled that it was cruel and unusual for him to be sentenced to death after his crime had been downgraded. Now, experts believe that the decision will mean that all the inmates on death row in Oregon will no longer be eligible for the death penalty. Oregon already has a pretty interesting history with the death penalty. It's still on the books. Technically, a person can be convicted of aggravated murder, of course, and receive a death penalty sentence. But the state, at least right now, has no intention to follow through with that. And the state has flip-flopped on capital punishment, but basically since it became a state. Here's Jeff Ellis, an attorney with the Oregon Capital Resource Center. Oregon has had a very fickle relationship with the death penalty. Um, while we had the death penalty at the time that we became a state, um, in 1914, we abolished it and we put it in the Constitution. The idea being that, well, once it's a constitutional prohibition against the death penalty, We'll never have to reconsider this. Um, but surprise, surprise, only six years later, the people voted on it again, and then they reinstated the death penalty. Um, we abolished the death penalty again in 1964, um, again by popular vote. Um, and then uh, we changed it again in the Constitution after the US Supreme Court in 1976 said that states could continue with the death penalty. That's a lot of back and forth, especially with voting involved. That's not an easy thing to do. Now, even though right now, technically, the death penalty is legal in Oregon, the state has only executed two people since 1976, and there's been a moratorium on executions since 2011. We went into the KGW vault for that day that Governor John Kitzhaber put that in place. Under Article 5, Today, Oregon's governor pushed the pause button on the execution of Gary Haugen. I'm exercising my authority as governor to issue a temporary reprieve in the case of Gary Haugen during the remainder of my term in office. Haugen had waived his right to appeals and said he wanted off of death row to die by lethal injection. The courts said yes. Now the governor is saying no for Haugen or anyone else. It is time for this state to consider a different approach. I refuse to be part of a compromised and inequitable system any longer, and I will not allow further executions to take place while I'm governor.
Oregon voters reinstated the death penalty in 1984. Crime victim advocate exactly Steve Dole believes the governor's personal side, beliefs shouldn't trump that. There's constitutional provisions that he's ignoring that have been passed by, in the state of Oregon that have to do with the death penalty, that have to do with sentencing, that have to do with victims' rights. And he's completely thumbing his nose at those provisions. The last two executions happened under Kitzhopper's watch in the 1990s. The governor says that's weighed on him. I do not believe those executions made us safer. Certainly, I don't believe they made us more noble as a society. And I simply cannot participate once again in something that I believe to be morally wrong. One of Haugen's attorneys was here for the announcement today. Well, I think we believed that the governor would not take this action. And we're surprised, that he, and I'm surprised, and I'm sure Gary's surprised that he did. Interesting look into the KGW vault. Oh, I keep sending you questions and comments. We're going to address a few. I'm looking at a couple right now that I want to talk about when we return and finish the story right after this. Hey, all right, let's get, a, uh, get to a couple questions. We actually have a considerable amount of time. I do want to tell you about our QR code behind us to take us to our, take you to a link to our weekly newsletter, which kind of compiles what we do each week to give you an idea of maybe the, some of the things that we think are the biggest stories or the most interesting things we do on this weird little show we have. Dan writing in and saying, depressing program tonight. Oh, it wasn't too depressing. Sometimes talking about these really serious issues can be tough on a Friday when you're like looking to the weekend and you're just trying to enjoy the, the end of the week. Yeah, it's, it's, they are heavy things, but um, they are important topics. So sorry to depress you, but yeah, have to do it sometimes. Margaret wrote in, this was interesting. She says, what's up with the intense focus on the housing crisis? Why do news outlets not seem to address the painfully obvious drug problems leading to homelessness and crime or the mental health factors? Is it a faux pas to address these? Definitely a complex issue. So a couple things there. One, we do address those. In fact, when you talk about the housing crisis, that is a crisis of homelessness. And it, we, when we discuss it it, 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 it incorporates those problems with drug addiction and with mental illness and mental health issues. So we do discuss those issues altogether. But one thing I will say, as I'm maybe kind of reading between the lines here, is that all people from all classes of wealth deal with drug addiction. All of them deal with issues with mental illness. But the people who are on the fringe of homelessness already, sometimes those issues that plague everyone will take them and put them on the streets in a, in a, in a, in a, in a situation that is very, very, if not impossible to overcome on their own. So that is why maybe you feel like, if I'm reading this correctly, Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not. If I'm not, let me know. Use the hashtag. Hey, Dan, I'll, I'll write you back. We can chat online. Uh, Jeff wrote in and said, what is the name of that moment when you finish talking to another reporter and then you both stare into the camera for a couple of beats with anxiety? <laughs> Laurel's off camera laughing. I don't know that that has a name. He said, uh, hashtag anchor talk trade craft. Um, I don't have anxiety. Is it giving you anxiety that we do that, that we stare at you for a moment silently as we all ponder our thoughts? Um, usually we're just waiting for like a graphic to wipe or something like that. But uh, sorry to make one person depressed tonight and another person anxious. And then Steve wrote in and said, night after night, Dan, on your program and others, we hear our police are not responding to citizen calls of complaints. It begs the question, what are the police doing? So uh, we've covered that too, as we've kind of questions their response times on certain things. And what they're saying is, is that they're going to these priority one calls, which are just imagine the most serious of the serious. Um, and we've talked about the uptick in some of the more violent crime that we've had in this city. So that is what they're responding to. But you make a good point because I would like to have a more in-depth look at that. And hopefully we, we kind of want to talk to police right now We've been trying to arrange some type of opportunity to get a close-up look on what a, a given night might look like for them and how they disperse their people around the city based on the calls that are coming into 911. So, Steve, I like the way you're thinking. We've been thinking the same way. Well, that does it for us tonight. Uh, it is a Friday. Hopefully you had a, a pretty good week and you enjoyed the show and we answered some of your questions. And if not, please send them our way. We'll do our best. We'll sign a reporter to your thoughts. How about that? That's the story. See you on Monday. <clears throat> Hello. So who's back there? Is Martine back there?